Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Friday, January 22nd, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. NASA trained an AI to detect craters on Mars, a possible discovery of giant prehistoric carnivorous worms, a new Swedish practice to adopt, and a mobile site that will match you with your film critic soulmate. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. NASA has a number of ways to observe and learn about Mars. There's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which sends pictures of the red planet back to Earth every day. There's the rovers physically on the planet. Currently, Perseverance is on its way over and will touch down in mid-February. But we've never had any physical matter brought back from Mars. And while it's definitely something that NASA scientists are working on, we're probably a ways away. Until then, they have to work with imaging data to discern information about the planet's age, history, safe landing areas for the rovers, and other planetary characteristics. Of particular use are Mars's craters which can occasionally lead to discoveries like the presence of subsurface ice and more regularly can tell scientists a lot about the planet's history when they can determine the age of the craters themselves. Newer craters are a bit easier to figure out, and the scientists are able to extrapolate the age of older ones from the newer ones, but the real challenge is finding the craters to study at all. With imaging data covering the entire planet, it is a ton to comb through. But it's a task that's not quite so labor-intensive for a machine. NASA scientists are now using a machine learning algorithm to find new craters. At the end of last year, the AI found dozens of hitherto unspotted craters in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images. Quoting Wired, First, the AI was fed nearly 7,000 orbiter photos of Mars, some with previously discovered craters and others without any, to teach the algorithm how to detect a fresh strike. After the classifier was able to accurately detect craters in the training set, Carrie Wagstaff, a computer scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, and her team loaded the algorithm onto a supercomputer at the lab and used it to comb through a database of more than 112,000 images from the orbiter. There's nothing new with the underlying machine learning technology, says Wagstaff. We used a pretty standard convolutional network to analyze the image data, but being able to apply it at scale is still a challenge. That was one of the things we had to wrestle with here. Most recent craters on Mars are small, and might only be a few feet across, which means that they appear as dark, pixelated blotches on context images. If the algorithm compares the image of the candidate crater with an earlier photo from the same area and finds that it's missing the dark patch, there's a good chance that it's found a new crater. The date of the earlier image also helps establish the timeline for when the impact happened. Once the AI had identified some promising candidates, NASA researchers were able to do some follow-up observations with the orbiter's high-resolution camera to confirm that the craters actually existed. Last August, the team got its first confirmation when the orbiter photographed a cluster of craters that had been identified by the algorithm. It was the first time that an AI had discovered a crater on another planet. End quote. And while manually examining the photos can take about 45 minutes per image, the AI is able to spot craters in an image within 5 seconds. Looking forward, the team hopes to speed up the process even more by having the AI analyze the data in space before it's sent back to Earth. Quoting again, This will allow for more flexible and responsive missions, since the orbiter won't have to wait for humans to tell it to check out a point of interest. If it detects a possible crater, it can immediately do a follow-up observation with a more sensitive instrument. And since Mars orbiters are starved for bandwidth, it will also help conserve this precious resource by only sending back images that show interesting changes on the surface. End quote. But that is also a ways away. The computing power currently required is far too massive for what's available on a Mars orbiter. Still, even having the tech available on Earth is a huge step forward, and a very necessary one considering the rapidly increasing amount of data coming in from space. Giant carnivorous worms. Sounds like something out of Monty Python or a Lemony Snicket book. But researchers say they've possibly found the ancient dens of honest-to-goodness giant carnivorous worms. These six-foot-long marine worms lived 20 million years ago in burrows at the bottom of the sea near the shores of present-day Taiwan. 
At least that's where the 319 trace fossils were found by a team of geoscientists who published their analysis of the fossils yesterday in the journal Scientific Reports. Since the worms consisted of soft tissue, like, you know, worms, they've long since deteriorated. But the team was able to analyze trace fossils left behind by the worms' movements in the burrows. Quoting Gizmodo, The team from National Taiwan University discovered hundreds of pockmarks peppering Taiwan's rocky shoreline. They found the holes veered horizontally as they went deeper, forming a boomerang-shaped burrow about one inch wide and six feet deep. The tapering bend of the burrow suggested to the team that the earth beneath the creature either became harder to dig through at a certain depth or became more anoxic. Worms breathe through their skin, so if the soil they're immersed in doesn't have enough oxygen, it can be deadly. Where the burrows opened onto the then sea floor, there was a feathering pattern, the team identified, which suggested that the silty sea bottom had collapsed around the structure in a funnel shape, indicative of a vacuum left by a creature yanking itself back into its lair. They concluded that the animals that made the burrows are close relatives of today's killer bobbit worms. End quote. And just so you know, bobbit worms, or sand striker worms, are very much still around today, mostly in the Atlantic Ocean, often near coral reefs. They range in length from 4 inches to 10 feet. So, you know, fully horrifying. Ludwig Luemark, a sedimentologist on the research team, said that at first they thought they were dealing with very fancy shrimp, or possibly some type of bivalve. But, quoting again, the shrimp would have left turnaround offshoot chambers in their dens, while the worms are more of a one-way operation. And a bivalve suspect would have had a cul-de-sac at the end of the burrow, marking where it made space for its shell. End quote. Wired emphasizes, however, that even with ruling those out, there's a lot we can't be sure of. Quoting Wired, The missing morphology is in fact a problem, says Terence Gosselner, senior curator of invertebrate zoology at the California Academy of Sciences, who wasn't involved in the work. Bobbit worms belong to a class of worms known as polychaetes, some of which are vegetarians, and some of which grow as large as the predator in question. So it's possible that the feathering of the burrow isn't a sign that the resident had been hunting fish, but rather just poking its head out to feed on other things. I think any time a worm retracts, it's going to leave similar kinds of feathering, and the collapsed structures that they talk about, from my standpoint, says Gosselner, they could well be absolutely right, but there are a lot of other explanations too. End quote. So maybe it's not the prehistoric ancestor of the sand striker worm. Maybe it's even worse. Maybe it was the graboids from Trimmers. Now that would be scary. I've been a VPN user for years. I like having that added security in my browsing and, frankly, have also gotten hooked on a lot of TV shows from the UK. If you're looking for a VPN yourself, I recommend NordVPN. They've got over 5,200 super fast servers in 59 countries and use double data encryption for increased anonymity. Protect your data whether you're at home or on the go with their unlimited bandwidth and 24-7 customer support. And NordVPN is compatible with Windows, Mac, and Linux. Linux, plus it has a Google Chrome extension and an app for Android or iOS. You can secure up to six devices with just one account, including your smart TV or router, so you can be protected no matter what. And as a special offer for listeners of the Kotki Ride Home, you can get 68% off a two-year plan with NordVPN. That's only $3.71 a month. Plus, you get an additional month free at nordvpn.com slash kotki or use coupon code kotki. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash kotki for 68% off and an additional free month when you sign up for a two-year plan. There's yet another Scandinavian term making the trending rounds lately. This one has been around in some circles for a while. There even used to be a cafe in Manhattan by this name that I went to a few times. It's called Fika. F-I-K-A. And it's basically the Swedish word for a coffee break but in practice means so much more. Quoting Quartz, The word fika is used both as a noun and a verb, and is derived from the Swedish word for coffee, a national obsession for the world's third largest coffee-drinking nation. 
Unlike the American-style caffeine jolt, the Swedish coffee break is a moment to literally leave work behind. Taken first around 10 a.m. and then at 3 p.m., it's not a strategy for multitasking or for fitting in another mini-meeting. It's a chance to relax in the company of colleagues. The long-standing Swedish social ritual doesn't necessarily even have to involve coffee. The key is to pause your day. End quote. Now, you can have your coffee or tea, whatever your pleasure, and ideally, you'd pair your beverage with a fresh baked good. But the main point is to take a real, actual break from work. Lars Ackerlund, who owned that chain of Fika coffee shops here in New York City, told courts that taking a Fika break two or three times a day makes them more productive. And a number of studies have backed this up. Quoting again, In 2010, a Grant Thornton study found that Swedish workers were the least stressed worldwide. Perhaps in part because Swedish companies are experimenting with the six-hour workday and made FICA mandatory. And even though only 1% of Swedish employees work overtime, according to the latest OECD Better Life Index, they're not any less productive. Linköping University professor Viveka Adelsvard has studied the history of Swedish social rituals and says breaks like FICA may actually boost productivity. Studies show that people who take a break from their work don't do less. It's actually the opposite. Efficiency at work can benefit from these kinds of get-togethers, she writes on her university blog. Her observations support a 2014 Stanford University work productivity study that argues for capping the work week at 50 hours maximum. End quote. And Nayako Yano, the general design manager at Muji, says she noticed that Swedish workers are exceptionally good at switching between relaxation and focus. And within office spaces, the fact that the break is taken together, across hierarchies, putting all of that aside for a few minutes, can really help break down barriers and encourage healthy forms of bonding among colleagues. When I read about Fika, I realized that I've kind of set my schedule up this way without meaning to. I take a mid-morning break to have a snack and coffee and pull myself away from the endless feeds and emails I'd been staring at all morning, and then I take another no-screen break in the afternoon once this podcast goes up. Of course, I'm not in an office space chatting with coworkers, and I don't always manage to take both of those breaks every day, but that's the goal, and on the days that I do, there is a noticeable difference in my energy, focus, and overall contentment levels. Now I just need to get better about my baked goods game. If you want to dive deeper into Fika, there's a few books out there. One that kept popping up for me is actually a recipe book, but it also includes a lot of information about the custom and how to adopt it in your own life. It's called Fika, the Art of the Swedish Coffee Break by Anna Bronis and Johanna Kinvall. And the official Sweden YouTube account also produced a six-part series on Fika back in 2016 that you can watch to learn more about it. Links to both of those in the show notes. Even with movie theaters largely closed, there are still tons of movies being released on streaming platforms every week, and, you know, an unconquerable backlog on each platform. If you need a little assistance combating the paradox of choice when you sit down to unwind with a movie at the end of the day, it can help to turn to reviews of various movies you're interested in. A problem that can arise, however, is that even professional movie critics are still just stating their opinion, as expert an opinion as it may be. And there's a good chance that they just have different taste than you do. You could stumble on a terrible review of a movie that you ultimately may have enjoyed, but never really gave it a chance because the review you found soured it for you. In the past, I've been given the advice to try to remember the names of movie critics whose reviews of movies I've agreed with in the past and keep an eye out for what they recommend. Look for their reviews of specific movies I'm interested in instead of seeking out reviews from random reviewers who show up on Google. And to help with this effort, a software engineer who goes by Eleanor Clarinet Online has created MovieCriticMatchmaker.com. It only works in a mobile browser, but it functions a bit like Tinder, except instead of people, you're swiping movies. Left for rotten, right for fresh, and up to skip if you haven't seen it or don't really have an opinion about it. And to find your movie critic match, you swipe through 40, quote, polarizing movies made recently-ish, end quote. And at the end of swiping through those 40, you are shown a couple of critics who agreed with you on the most movies you rated and the ones who disagreed with you the most. 
You can do it as many times as you want, and you'll get slightly different movies to swipe through each time, so therefore sometimes different results, because not every critic in the database has reviewed every movie shown. And honestly, I've barely seen any of the movies that showed up for me when I was going through this process. Not that they're obscure, I'm just really bad at seeing movies. And I had a lot of trouble deciding which category to put any of the movies in, so if you are very much not a critical cinephile like me, your results may not feel too accurate. But nonetheless, my top match was CNN media critic Brian Lowry, and scanning through his Twitter and some of his reviews, I do actually think we're pretty aligned. And at the very least, I found a new film critic whose writing I enjoy, and anything that pumps up journalists right now is good in my book. So, not an exact science, but a fun enough site and one that gives you results that might serve a pretty functional purpose in your life. That is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'm going to go take a little fika. I hope you have a great weekend, and I will talk to you again on Monday.